Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. So this is the second in a series of uh, open research webinars that are organized between uh, uh, the Eclipse Foundation of, of, and OW2 uh, to uh, showcase the collaborative projects that, uh, uh, in which we are participating. So um, the agenda this afternoon, uh, now before the agenda, um, I'm introducing to Philip Kreef, who's uh, the Eclipse Foundation, and I need to introduce Marco Yan, who will be our moderator from the Eclipse Foundation as well, who will be our moderator this afternoon, and will uh, handle the uh, Q&A sessions. So the agenda is a quick welcome uh, and an introduction. Uh, after that, we will have uh, two uh, presentations of uh, uh, collaborative uh, projects, research collaborative projects. Uh, Decoder, uh, which is a um, project in which uh, OW2 is involved, which will be introduced by Virgil Prevosto, the CEA. And PDP4E, uh, uh, the project in which the Eclipse Foundation is involved, will be introduced by Antonio Kung and uh, Jos Samuel Martin. And uh, we will hand over to Philip Kreef of the Xleep Foundation uh, after that to, uh, for the final wrap up. Uh, then I now have a couple of um, announcements from the Eclipse Foundation and OW2. The first one uh, concerns the um, OW2's annual conference, which we call OW2Con. So OW2Con 21 will uh, take place on June 23rd, 24th. It will be an online event. And the call for presentation is still open and closes on March 15. So check it out on the link that is on your screen here. Um, the Eclipse, uh, no, another thing that we need to announce, which is a workshop on software composition analysis and uh, dependency management that will be organized around the Fasten Research Project, uh, that link on April the 8th. Uh, then there is this uh, call for presentation for uh, an event held by the Eclipse Foundation called SAM Mobility 2021. And this call for presentations will close on April 8, uh, 16. So uh, please check it out on the link that you have on the screen. And uh, of course, there is, will be um, another uh, open research webinar, which will be held on June 1st, that uh, Philip will announce at the end of this, uh, of this session. So what are um, open source organizations doing with uh, uh, collaborative research projects? Well, um, we, we know that open source is a uh, fantastic vehicle for collaborative uh, research. It um, helps us avoid uh, having to deal with uh, complicated and costly IP, uh, IP uh, intellectual property negotiations. So um, open source creates a common ground for different partners to work together. And open source organizations such as the Eclipse Foundation and OW2 are here to provide these common resources uh, that uh, will enable partners to work together in a neutral environment. So that neutral environment that we provide includes an infrastructure for open collaboration. Usually it has a, 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 a Git repo, a wikis, mailing lists, uh, everything that uh, partners need to cooperate on uh, in, in research. We also uh, act as um, um, uh, uh, dissemination partners. That's the term in this uh, EU funded uh, project, dissemination partners. So we help uh, projects reach out outside of the uh, scope of uh, the, the partners and uh, become public, become known, become visible uh, um, towards the open market. So that's what we call ecosystem development. Then, of course, since uh, uh, the EU, uh, European Commission uh, is ask, really asking that uh, code be available as uh, open source software. Uh, we have experience and best practices to help you implement uh, open source uh, software, uh, publish open source software under uh, open source licenses properly and implement the best governance, uh, the best practices in open source governance. It's not exactly like working in a totally proprietary environment. There are some best practices that are uh, worth knowing about. And the fourth uh, stage is, uh, well, we help you manage your IP. 
uh, in this respect, the uh, Exit Foundation is more uh, 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 is better organized, if I can say, uh, more directive, whereas OW2 is more liberal. So we have a greater flexibility in licenses, where the uh, uh, Exit Foundation uh, provides more rigor in managing the IP. So with all that, we, uh, we, we represent the platform uh, upon which partners who have not, nothing in common, who even may compete against each other, can work collaboratively and develop the open source uh, software. So the outcome of the collaborative research project has to be some out open source project, uh, open source software, can even be open data and be published. And having said that, we as open source organizations can hold this, uh, this outcome, these results, and that does not stop all partners to uh, on top of that, further develop their own uh, commercial offerings. Even, they can even be proprietary extension of, uh, of what has been uh, uh, developed within the framework of the uh, research project. So that's the, the rationale uh, behind uh, op developing um, well research and developing research software and uh, open source licenses, leveraging the uh, resources and the experience and, um, and, and what can offer the open source um, organizations such as the Exit Foundation. So that explains what we, do, what we are doing here. And we are very happy to, um, to organize, to jointly organize these uh, webinar on open research webinars. And uh, that enable us to showcase each time a couple of projects. So the first project this afternoon is um, uh, decoder and decoder is a um, uh, an, an environment for uh, developers that enables developers to quickly understand uh, uh, what's in a, a project to quickly get proper information in a project and decoder also helps make this information verifiable uh, so it's a complement to uh, the almost uh, you know, preferred uh, development environment uh, that helps uh, increase uh, your productivity and also uh, speed up the onboarding of uh, new uh, developers or new maintenance on a given project. So without uh, further ado, um, I'm handing over uh, uh, to Virgil Prevosto from the uh, CAA, or at least uh, CA Tech, so it's a research um, organization uh, attached to the French CEA, and Virgil is the uh, scientific lead of uh, the Decoder project. So now I'm going to uh, unshare my screen so that uh, Virgil can take over. Okay, so thanks, uh, Cedric, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. So indeed, uh, I'm a researcher at uh, CLIST, uh, uh, mostly uh, developing the pharmacy uh, source code analysis tool. And I will present you uh, the decoder project, uh, as uh, Cedric just uh, said. So basically, this is an H2020 project that started a bit more than two years ago. So we are basically in the, the final year of, of the project. And the main, the main goal of Decoder is to provide some kind of unified platform or unified database where you can uh, store and uh, retrieve uh, basically any kind of uh, information that uh, may be useful uh, during uh, some, uh, some part of the software development uh, and more generally the software uh, life cycle. Uh, basically the, the idea is really to, to be able to provide uh, or useful information for uh, all kinds of uh, stakeholders. So in, in the project, we focused on uh, three main uh, roles, namely uh, developers, so, uh, people who, who are writing code, reviewers, so, uh, people who will uh, validate so the work of developers, and the maintainers that 
may come uh, a few months or a few years later and uh, we'll have to try to understand what uh, all this uh, is about. Uh, basically, the project uh, gathers uh, seven partners. Uh, the coordination uh, is uh, done by uh, Technicon. And the technical work uh, is centered around two main uh, uh, kind of tools. First, uh, uh, software engineering tools, so, so uh, for uh, design, uh, analyzing and proving uh, code or testing uh, code on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, natural language processing tools, which uh, we hope uh, will uh, help us uh, extract the valuable information from uh, uh, documents uh, in order to uh, provide more uh, structured and more formal uh, specifications for the analysis uh, tools. And uh, in order to propose um, uh, a good, uh, a suitable uh, methodology of use of uh, decoder, uh, we also have so first uh, methodological uh, work going on, uh, work on um, a user interface that uh, will enable uh, users make the best uh, usage of, uh, of the tools. And of course, a set of uh, use cases to ensure that uh, what we propose is uh, indeed uh, something that is uh, practically uh, doable. So in uh, decoder speak, uh, the, the main, uh, this uh, main uh, database where you can uh, store uh, everything is called the PKM for persistent knowledge monitor. And uh, it's uh, basically a document oriented uh, database. Uh, MongoDB, not to uh, name it. Uh, through, through which uh, all uh, tools that are involved in the project uh, interact. Uh, it goes from um, uh, the, the tools, uh, the analysis tools such as uh, Framacy and uh, OpenGML, so Framacy for uh, C and C++, uh, OpenGML for Java, or uh, Testar for um, uh, GUI uh, testing. Uh, on the um, NLP side, um, uh, we have uh, basically two, two tools um, that will uh, interact with uh, the PKM. Uh, the knowledge extractor, which is meant to extract information from uh, uh, natural language uh, documents, and a knowledge formalizer that uh, should help uh, user uh, provide formal specifications from the information that has been uh, extracted otherwise. Uh, we hope also to use uh, UML uh, to, on, the, on the model side. And uh, on the, the other way around, uh, also to be able to generate some, uh, some documentation from the, the code itself in a, uh, to provide uh, a better, uh, more e easily understandable view for the, for the end user, uh, rather than uh, going through, through the code. Uh, finally, the last point is to be able to take advantage of uh, all this, uh, the information given by all these tools uh, through uh, an, uh, an ID. Uh, so there's one that is uh, currently under development in uh, within the project, but uh, we also hope um, to be able to interface with, of course, existing uh, ID uh, in the in the future. Uh, everything uh, goes through uh, JSON schemas, so that uh, communication should not be too difficult uh, at this uh, at this level. 
to give a bit, little bit more details uh, on the architecture of the, the tools. So at the heart of uh, the tools is this uh, MongoDB uh, database, which store uh, everything. And uh, the preferred way of uh, communication is uh, through uh, classical uh, REST uh, server, uh, whose interface is uh, described through uh, open API uh, uh, documents so that uh, it's uh, quite easy to, to generate uh, uh, bindings for a wide variety of uh, languages so that uh, the the communication is not uh, not that difficult, uh, either for the tools uh, within the project and uh, hopefully for external tools uh, as well. Uh, there are also uh, direct uh, ways to to interact with uh, the PKM if uh, once one prefers that, but it was uh, rather the rather the rest of the early experiments. Uh, with uh, with the PKM and uh, nowadays uh, it's uh, it's preferred to to use this uh, more standard uh, way of uh, doing it. Uh, so regarding uh, natural language processing, which is uh, at the heart of uh, of decoder, uh, the idea is to go uh, both ways. So on the on the one hand. Um, uh, starting from uh, um, sorry, uh, starting from uh, documentation, so PDF or Word documents or comments uh, within the code, uh, bug reports, and uh, and so on, and uh, be able to uh, see the correspondences with uh, the symbols that are used uh, in the code in order to be able to see what is related to which uh, function and which, which modules uh, when uh, uh, some paragraph of the documentation is, is concerned. Uh, so that we, we can more easily uh, relate uh, documentation and, uh, and code and uh, hopefully be able to uh, to extract uh, uh, formal specifications that could be given to analysis tools uh, from this documentation. Uh, realistically, we hope uh, rather to be able to assist users in writing such specifications rather than generating it uh, completely automatically. Uh, similarly, we also hope to be able to provide uh, some um, categorization of uh, code patterns uh, in order to, uh, again, semi-automatically extract uh, valuable information uh, from, uh, from the code itself. Uh, first application of that uh, being to propose uh, uh, to, to spot the identifiers uh, that uh, might have been uh, mis, uh, misspelled and uh, propose uh, a correction to, to the developers uh, in order to, to try to fix uh, some, uh, some issues uh, that way. Uh, finally, the last uh, ingredient of uh, the project is what is called the abstract semi-formal models. Uh, well, the idea is to have uh, some kind of uh, graphical language kind of uh, UML uh, sequence diagrams, so to say, uh, which let uh, users describe the effects of uh, some functions on the data structures that are involved, so typically uh, list or trees, uh, or uh, more, uh, more complex uh, structures. Uh, in a, so in a graphical uh, way, and to be able to um, uh, animate uh, this, uh, these diagrams to obtain uh, some kind of uh, graphical uh, debugger uh, to, to play with, uh, with the program in, a, in an abstract uh, way. Uh, again, we hope to be able to use uh, the, the tools from Decoder to have uh, 
a way to uh, semi-automatically generate these diagrams, either from the documentation or uh, from the code or from both, uh, and start uh, playing with, uh, with them. So currently, so the first uh, draft of uh, the uh, ASFM uh, language, which is understood by all tools and a few extensions uh, that are specific to, to some, uh, some of them. Uh, plus uh, uh, conversion tools uh, from documents to, to ASF. Uh, there's currently a prototype uh, decoder front end, which uh, <coughs> is uh, a browser, uh, browser based and should work on uh, any, any browser. It's uh, under EV development, and uh, we hope to be able to have a demo uh, in, uh, in a few weeks uh, now. Uh, basically, uh, we have uh, for now basic support for the main analysis tools and uh, NLP tools uh, that can feed the, the PKM or retrieve uh, documents from, uh, from it. So to conclude, uh, currently, uh, the main goal is to finish uh, the API of the, the PKM. So most of it is, uh, is done now, but there are still some uh, uh, some functions that are uh, that are missing. Uh, work on the NLP uh, training to be able to extract more uh, valuable information from uh, from them and uh, finish the uh, development of the client. Externally, uh, it might be interesting to explore the possibility to have. Uh, an interface with uh, existing tools. So for instance, uh, since we are here, uh, Teia instead of the uh, decoder uh, or made uh, client. Uh, also to propose um, an interface with um, uh, the possibility to have standard uh, queries uh, language, such as uh, language server protocol, which is uh, widely used in, uh, I, by uh, IDs. It does not make sense for all the um, uh, functionalities exposed by the PKM, but uh, for many of them. So it would be interesting for, for that. And uh, finally, to have some uh, beta testing campaigns uh, outside of uh, Decoder. So this is the first one on the doc to, uh, to SFM tools that is uh, scheduled. Uh, and uh, if uh, the, the whole PKM stack is uh, mature enough uh, for the second semester of uh, 2021, uh, we, we hope to be able to offer it for, uh, for beta testing as well. OK, thanks uh, for your attention. This, this concludes what I wanted to say, but uh, I will be happy to answer some questions. And if uh, if you want to have uh, further information, uh, you can uh, reach us by uh, many, many ways. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really very pleased to introduce our next speakers, Antonio Kung from Trialog and Jot Samuel Martin from Universitat Politecnica de Madrid. Sorry for, uh, for the accent. Uh, Antonio is the CEO of and co-founder of Trialog. He has more than 30 years of experience in the field of cyber physical system and IoT. He was coordinator of numerous national and European projects, including uh, PDP4E. And uh, he's, active, uh, he's active in standardization on the IoT security and data protection, and he's also the editor of several IoT standards. Uh, last but not least, Antonio has a master's degree on Harvard uh, from Harvard University and engineer degree from Ecole Centrale Paris. Um, you have, we have also Yap Samuel, who is a researcher from the Universidad of, of Madrid. and. Uh, his research work focused on different categories of non-functional software and service requirements, especially on, on the categories of accessibility and privacy. Yep Samuel is scientific and technical lead of PDP4E. He participated to also several other European projects uh, and national and private research project. And the results from his research have been applied in collaboration with private companies uh, to fields like telecommunication, banking and financial services, social network, transportation, etc. So, Antonio, Yop Samuel, thanks for accepting your, our invitation, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you to the Eclipse Foundation uh, for uh, inviting us to this uh, webinar. As uh, Philip explained, uh, we, in fact, the three of us, because uh, Philip is not an author of this presentation, but uh, he's also uh, helping us in this project and in the community that uh, we are trying to, to create. Um, the three of us are working in the PDP40 project, uh, this uh, European funded project funded by the European Commission. But uh, our goal today is not to focus so much on PDP4E, but uh, on what goes beyond. And what goes beyond is uh, this uh, privacy by model community that uh, is mentioned here. Um, uh, by the way, can you please confirm that uh, you can see my screen? Because I have the participants list to the right hand side, and it may be blocking the, we can the see. screen. We can see it. OK. Uh, so, I will start with uh, this slide, uh, which uh, wonders whether privacy and data protection should be an engineer's job. And uh, spoiler, the answer is that yes, uh, it should. Uh, here we have uh, several uh, articles, several posts uh, from different blogs and engineering journals, including IEEE Spectrum, which is the most uh, well-known journal from the largest electrical and uh, electronical engineers association. So in summary, they say that, yes, that privacy in particular, GDPR, which is the European regulation for data protection, should be a matter of engineers because they are responsible uh, for carrying out the work, for creating the, the system. And in the end, if they uh, don't, don't think about uh, privacy and data protection, who will do that? We cannot just uh, release the responsibility to, to lawyers. And with uh, that idea in mind, we created the PDP for a project, which uh, tries to introduce the legacy, the existing privacy and data protection methods that exist from previous research that are out there, but which cannot be systematically applied. Uh, we tried, we have tried to introduce them into the mainstream software and system engineering practice. Uh, by creating a set of privacy and data protection engineering methods and tools. Not only methods and tools, uh, but um, we have also provided a set of, or we are providing a set of knowledge bases, uh, demonstrators in two domains, uh, targeting uh, energy and connected vehicles. And uh, also we are, well, the tools, um, by the way, uh, include well-known tools in the Eclipse community, uh, which are, for instance, Papyrus for modeling, open search for assurance. This is a risk management tool which doesn't have yet any logo, so we put there the logo of the project where it uh, uh, came from. And uh, in the end, we want to make them available to the, to the community uh, as uh, mostly open source projects so that they can, as I said, apply uh, this uh, practice, this published practice from the privacy and data protection research into daily activities, into daily use uh, tools and methods. Uh, the approach that we are following in our development is that of model-driven engineering. Uh, model-driven engineering brings to software, and maybe you can be familiar with that, or maybe it sounds a bit uh, uh, far from your practice, but it's easy to understand if you think that it brings to software engineering what has already been uh, carried out in other disciplines and what it was known as model engineering. In model engineering, you have a model, which is basically a miniature working representation of a machine. And in software engineering, you have model-driven engineering, where you have a processable, a working representation, in this case, a diagram, which has a model behind. But it's not just a diagram that you can depict, but it's uh, an artifact that uh, you can process, that you can uh, uh, expand, that uh, you can uh, analyze where you can perform things, activities as if it was uh, any other software artifact. And what's the role of uh, uh, model driven engineering in privacy and data protection? Well, it's a uh, multiple role. There are different facets uh, dealing with uh, different disciplines and with different types of models that uh, we address in PDP 40. Uh, for instance, I would just like to to pose some, some questions that uh, can be answered by these models without going into the details. From the perspective of uh, analysis and design, uh, maybe they are the most well-known models that you may be familiar with. 
uh, we deal with the structural data models, uh, uh, focusing on, on data. You can think of uh, database models, which uh, help answering questions such as whether you are dealing with personal data, which of your fields of your records uh, hold personal data, whether it's sensitive personal data, uh, what's the basis for processing? Do you have uh, consent from the data subject? Is this for uh, legitimate purposes? Is this because a uh, uh, legal regulation tells you to store that data? Then another perspective is that of uh, procedural models, which um, uh, are usually known, for instance, as data flow diagrams. It's one kind of useful diagram, which uh, asks or, or lets answer other questions, such as uh, which processes you have where you're processing personal data, uh, and which are the processing activities that are being carried out, which are the data flows that are involved, what for uh, those processes are processing personal data, what's the purpose, which is a, a key concept in privacy and data protection, and uh, who will be able to run those processes and to access uh, those data. It's not just data at rest that you must uh, be concerned with, but also uh, data in, in movement and taking into account uh, the access control. And also, from the architectural perspective, uh, we can answer questions such as who is storing the data? Is it uh, fully under your control or is it uh, delegated to a data processor under which jurisdiction uh, have you sent the data abroad to a third country? Okay, so this is uh, regarding design, but there are other perspectives. Uh, for instance, requirements engineering, key in privacy and data protection, there are requirements that can appear as privacy goals and property requirements that uh, may come from uh, different regulations, for instance, GDPR, not only, uh, or for industrial standards. And all those requirements uh, would be void if they do not take into account the functional requirements uh, that provide the context for these privacy and data protection requirements. There's another source of specifications in privacy and data protection, and that's of risks. Uh, this is not a goal-oriented approach, but a risk-oriented approach where you have the Typical elements in a risk analysis, you have assets to protect, can be personal information, human rights of data subjects, the reputation of the business, not your useful assets in security engineering, for instance. What do you want to protect from, the threats, and how you want to address those threats? How do you want to solve it? How do you want to protect your assets, and how do you know that others are also protecting them as well if you are using other services? Then another relevant discipline is that of process assurance which, uh, for instance, answers uh, what activities are mandated. Uh, we mentioned requirements that may arise from GDPR, but it's not only product requirements, but also process requirements, activities that, that you must carry out, uh, for instance, carry out an impact assessment. Uh, if you have activities, you have roles that carry them out, and you have active artifacts that produce them and that provide evidence that you have carried out uh, those activities. Then there are also models for what are called assurance cases that provide, for instance, answers uh, to questions such as how you can argument that you are compliant, which is the, the way to have a logical proof that you are complying with the, with the law, and which are the evidences, which are the specific artifacts that you can use to say, hey, this is uh, a, a, a way to prove that uh, I'm compliant. And finally, the model of the development process, uh, persons, processes, and products that uh, are involved in your development process. All these are facets. So I put there this loop. Uh, they are not just that go one after the other, but they can happen in, in parallel and complement one another. And they complement one another from a functional perspective. Uh, we have created a tool set, but uh, tools are not integrated because you can use them for different activities, same as you would use a hammer and a screwdriver or a wrench uh, when you are doing do-it-yourself uh, activities uh, as in the, this workshop. You don't have one plug onto the other. This uh, model-based engineering is well established. Uh, there are communities, uh, there are bodies of knowledge, and there are standards. For instance, Antonio Kung, uh, who will uh, present now, is working on standard on model-based software and systems engineering, uh, which um, establishes a, a life cycle of models. And this life cycle of models can be also applied uh, to our project. And uh, in this life cycle, we have several points where we can share and uh, reuse models. So this slide uh, is a uh, second key idea in this presentation, and it's how we can share, or better, there we share and reuse models, because sometimes it may seem that models are artifacts that uh, should be kept for ourselves, and we don't think that's the case. So models start by defining a modeling language, which uh, is usually called meta-model or profiles in uh, modeling jargon. 
uh, you need to define the, the concepts that you're going to use. Then, uh, for any other perspectives that we mentioned, you need to model the regulatory constraints, the GDPR or uh, whichever regulation you're abiding by. And then you must tailor that to your, the context of your project. For instance, uh, your SME and only some uh, close supply. Then you instantiate the modeling your project. Uh, requirements, the requirements that I mentioned are meta requirements or templates. Uh, when they say that um, you must have a, a purpose to process uh, personal data, in your project, personal data means specific type of data, specific record. So it's just a, a template, a placeholder, but you need to instantiate that with your specific personal data. Then you transform your models, if appropriate, using our knowledge, comply with the regulations, and you validate. And there's a loop here because uh, there's a clear feedback. You don't validate just once. This is a, a continuous improvement, a continuous monitoring process. Uh, you can see now that there are some project-dependent parts and some project-specific parts. Uh, this is a first type of reuse, but it's not the only one. You can also have industry policies that provide context to your project and which are reusable because they come from industry practices. You can have patterns that describe reusable solutions that uh, can be reused in any project. You can also have knowledge bases, which uh, uh, can be uh, proprietary or open. There can be different ways to, to exploit them. And you can also have uh, the considerations of the uh, supply chain that can also provide their, their own results when you're integrating them in your project. So as you can see, there are many points where models can be, can be shared. And uh, now I'll give the floor to, to Antonio. Uh, yeah, hello, so everyone. Please. So what we just saw is that we have models everywhere, and we defined, we defined two type, types of model. One is how do we protect applications? So we call them application privacy protection models. And you can see here you have a list of uh, domains, health, social network, mobility, smart home, fintech. Uh, so from a consumer point of view, but also domains from an organization point of view or industry point of view, connected vehicles, smart energy, immobility, assisted living security. Just go next, go next. So on top of it, you do data processing. And we just heard about the discussion about data and you, have, you will cro you have cross domain analysis and things like that. So all those things must have their own application privacy protection models. If you go to the next slide. So, and the same for engineering, okay? So the engineer must be helped with lots of models and uh, depending on the perspective, framework, risk management, privacy operationalization and assurance. And this relates to uh, the previous slide, which actually uh, Samuel showed uh, with this uh, cycle. Okay. Next slide. So what we are proposing is uh, to have a community that will be uh, launched by Eclipse where uh, stakeholders get together and they provide guidance on how to produce and to exchange those models. Go to the next slide. Uh, next uh, item. So, and actually we think there will be a several task force, those which focus on applications. So for instance, COVID-19 uh, privacy protection model, and those who, who would focus on engineering, for instance, threat model, okay? Once we do that, next, those task force will produce models Okay, but the model has to be of good quality. You can have bad models and good models. So what we'll do is in the community, we'll provide some requirements on the quality and how to validate those models. Once we have them, we go to next. We'll publish them uh, in the Eclipse uh, uh, community. That, that's the idea, okay. So go next. And uh, so uh, we want to launch uh, this, uh, uh, community uh, this year and uh, we will have initial projects uh, uh, concerning applications one is on connected uh, uh, sorry CITS which means cooperative intelligent transport system or connected vehicles and the other one is on data exchange focusing on smart grid okay and the reason is because we are involved in a number of those projects and concerning engineering, uh, we have exactly the tools which uh, Samuel has mentioned previously related to risk analysis, requirements engineering, privacy uh, by design and assurance. Um, the community participants uh, under the umbrella of Eclipse will be of course the PDP 4E partners, but we have started uh, uh, communicating with other participants for their participation. Anne Kavutian, you probably know, she, is, uh, uh, she invented the, the term privacy by design, uh, would be uh, the, the chair of this initiative. 
K11 is working on uh, something called Linden. I just got an email, Samuel, uh, just uh, 30 minutes ago that they want to join. The NIST Privacy Framework, uh, uh, they are also interested. Uh, University of Ulm is working on uh, something called privacypattern.org. Uh, actually, where Samuel is also involved. And uh, he, they are also working on connected vehicles. We also want to uh, attract the Gaia X uh, IDSA data space uh, stakeholders. And of course, uh, there are a number of competence network, in particular concerning cybersecurity. We have four big projects which we want to, to um, um, enroll. Okay, and of course, uh, there are other types of applications. I've seen uh, so, so for instance, fintech. I, I, I will be working on the standard on privacy guidelines for fintech, and we will ask, uh, we will provide guidance for them to provide models. Next. So that's the end of our presentation. You have here the links. And I would say the main contact point from now on is going to be Philip, because that's through the Eclipse Foundation that we'll have this community. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to, to thank uh, our speakers, Virgil, Antonio, and Yav Samuel for their great presentation presentations. Uh, second, I would like also to thank the audience uh, for joining our webinar. Uh, we are more than uh, welcome to, uh, yeah, you are more than welcome to provide any feedback and to promote our webinars. Uh, we will publish soon the presentations and the recording of on our website, so check it out. Um, and uh, if you are involved in any research project building uh, an open source solution, you are also welcome to propose a talk. So we will we'll try to inject you in our calendar. Um, as mentioned earlier, our next we webinar will happen June 1st, and we will present two other research projects, Eclipse Basics, which is an open platform on for Industry 4.0, and Fasten, which is, a, which is building a dependency management solution acting at the function level. So, Thanks again for coming. Uh, take care of yourself and uh, see you in June.